Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alicia Fowler, and I'm a fourth-year student in the Department of Politics here at the University of Virginia. And what I'm going to present to you today is some research that I've conducted for my undergraduate thesis. So I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit and focus more so on a specific policy, which is felon disenfranchisement. So the United States has used the right of suffrage as a means to divide citizens from non-citizens, in-group members from out-group members. Think back to a time in America's history when African Americans, women, and other minority groups were banned from participating in America's supposed democratic electoral process. Not only were these groups denied a political voice, but they were also denied a social standing or a membership pass into what I've called the U.S. Citizens Club. This club, of course, became more accepting in the 20th century. In 1920, women gained the right of suffrage through the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And then, of course, in 1965, one's race or color can no longer be used as a prerequisite to voting, resulting in the sharp increase in black voter registration rates. Yet despite these significant changes that have expanded the right to vote, the United States continues to disenfranchise millions of Americans, and by far the largest group who is disenfranchised today are those who have been convicted of a felony conviction through felon disenfranchisement. When studying felon disenfranchisement in the United States, the political science literature in general tends to primarily focus on the electoral consequences brought on by this policy. So some scholars may look at the ways in which this policy advantages the Republican Party and the ways in which it disadvantages the Democratic Party. Other scholars may make hypothetical projections as to what the voter turnout rate would have been had felons been granted the right to vote in a given election. Hmm. However, examining these electoral consequences, although they are important, they fail to assess the individual and psychological impact that this policy has on the individual felon, him or herself. So the goal for my ongoing research is to examine the impact that this policy has on the individual felon, and more specifically, just what effect it has on their citizenship. And so I focus on two particular aspects of citizenship in my research. The first is civic orientation, which I define as, number one, one's participatory involvement in either politics or in her community, and or number two, one's political engagement, which refers to one's interest in politics and overall awareness of the ongoing social and political issues that are occurring. So although felon disenfranchisement is a punitive policy that denies convicted felons of the right to vote and hence hinders their overall political participation, I hypothesize that it may also, paradoxically, enhance their political participation and interest in political issues. The second aspect of citizenship I focus on is membership, which I define here as one's position in society relative to others. So the question here is, how does felon disenfranchisement affect one's own perceptions of their citizenship status, their sense of belonging? And I hypothesize that this policy produces negative perceptions of social belonging and in turn makes convicted felons feel as if they are members of an outgroup. So, to test my proposed hypotheses, I conducted a series of interviews with 16 convicted felons in the state of Virginia. So why interviews? Because as mentioned before, the literature has adopted a more top-down approach when examining felon disenfranchisement in the United States. The literature has not yet asked felons themselves just what impact this policy has on their own sense of citizenship. And when the literature has adopted a more bottoms-up approach, when it has interviewed felons themselves, the analysis is usually limited to currently incarcerated felons or those who are still serving parole or those who are still on probation. So what I try to do is, I do interview those who are still on probation and on parole, but I also incorporate ex-offenders or former felons in my analysis as well, so those no longer carrying out their sentences. And so why Virginia? Because Virginia represents just one of two states, Kentucky being the other, that permanently disenfranchises people with a felony conviction. So rather than restoring one's rights upon the release from prison or upon the completion of probation or parole, felons who wish to vote in the state of Virginia must apply to the governor in order to have their rights restored. So I chose Virginia as a case study because it's a harsh state. It takes away a lot from the felon but makes it difficult for them to even get back just a little. 
so selection. A majority of the participants were selected through my collaborative efforts with the Offender Aid and Restoration here in Charlottesville and Arlington and the Virginia Organizing Project here in Charlottesville. Both of these organizations extend a helping hand to offenders. So OAR plays an active role in helping offenders and their families to reintegrate back into society, for example, helping them to find jobs. And VOP has recently launched a campaign that aims to help former felons interested in having their rights restored with the application process. So because both of these organizations are in contact with the population I aim to study, I notified the key leaders at these organizations about my research, and they agreed to help me um, select some of the participants whom I interviewed. And finally, one participant was actually selected at a local barbershop in Charlottesville. <laughs> so here are my sample demographics. Like I said, there's only 16 individuals that I interviewed. Um, as we see here, blacks um, represent a majority of those I interviewed, followed then by whites and one other. And this other is actually a Native American interviewee. Um, gender, males outnumber females 12 to 4, so a huge gender gap. Education, a majority of the participants um, have not obtained an education beyond high school. Um, three obtained some high school, which means that they dropped out. Three, some college, which means that they either dropped out of college or are currently in the process of um, obtaining some kind of college degree. And then one participant actually did um, complete college. And then in regards to socioeconomic status, um, even though I did not ask specifically how much money do you make a year, most of the participants describe themselves as being members of the lower class. And so my findings. Now, it's important to note that because convicted felons in the United States tend to lack the resources associated with the more common forms of participation, so money to donate to a political campaign, education to write an effective letter to their legislator, I probe their civic orientation through their involvement in the following activities. So going through the process of getting their rights restored. Do they do this? Encouraging those in their communities to get out and vote and or discussing politics at home and amongst friends. So here are some of the questions I asked. Even though you cannot vote, do you participate in politics in other ways? Have you considered applying to have your own rights restored? Are you aware of the ongoing political issues that are occurring here in Virginia or in the country? And how often do you discuss politics? And so my findings suggest a significant racial difference. So amongst the black participants, I did discover a more politically aware and engaged population than what the conventional wisdom suggests. These individuals reported discussing politics on a regular basis, keeping up with state and national affairs, and even participating in this recent election. So putting up campaign signs, passing up voter registration forms, etc. Two of the participants are even currently in the process of getting their own rights restored. But contrary to my proposed hypothesis, it wasn't their disenfranchised status that motivated these individuals to get more politically involved, but rather President Obama. And so this is what I've called the Obama effect. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst the white participants, I also found a politically aware and engaged population who reported discussing politics on a regular basis and keeping up with state and national affairs. But I did not find a similar trend amongst these white interviewees. I did not find an Obama effect. Um, they attributed their civic orientation to different factors, such as age, their prior incarceration. And even one, one individual um, reported that actually being incarcerated increased um, his level of political awareness and made him want to get more politically involved. Um, so my findings on membership. Here are some of the questions I asked. Is voting important to you? What does citizenship mean to you? Would you say that there is a connection between voting and citizenship? And lastly, do you feel like a citizen now that you cannot vote? And so my findings suggest that, as probably most would assume, felon disenfranchisement has a negative impact on felon's sense of their own citizenship. And participants, both black and white, reported feeling ostracized from society and like second-class citizens. Um, I just want to briefly read what one citizen had to say. He said, being a citizen means being a part of something much greater than you are. If you're a citizen, you actually belong to some state or country. But if you can't vote, you're not really a citizen. You're more like an alien living in your own country. Self-respect, belonging, membership, all that comes along with having the right to vote. They say that they want us, felons, to do something positive with our lives, to get involved in some way and reintegrate back into society. 
but then they tell us we can't vote. That's like saying we want you to do good, but you're still not like us. Okay, so there are, of course, other factors besides being denied the right to vote that negatively impact felons' perceptions of their own citizenship. So some scholars say that a felony conviction alone can serve as an, can serve as an exclusionary mechanism, which, of course, it can, right? Finding shelter, feeding oneself and family, finding, trying to find a job, all of these things affect how people relate how people would relate others to themselves, how they would relate others, other people's status to their own status. Um, but although these issues are more important and more pressing than voting, so obviously finding a job is going to be more important than going out to vote on election day for most people. So even though these other issues are more important, respondents still describes voting as a tool that can help to break down some of these hurdles that individuals with a felony conviction must confront. So as one participant said, everything is connected. Having a, felony on, uh, having a felony on your record affects the kind of job you can get, if you can even get a job, and then that affects your paycheck, which affects how you can take care of your family. You can't even find decent housing without a, with a felony conviction, which means you have to go live with family or friends, but some people can't even do that. But if you can't vote, you can't break the cycle. I can't vote against job discrimination or housing discrimination. So... What, what, what this, the reason why I like this quote and the reason why it's significant is because, like I said, a lot of people would make the argument that, well, yes, voting is important, but there are so many other issues that individuals are thinking about who have been convicted of a felony in this country or who have been released from prison. And that's true. I'm not disagreeing with that. However, individuals in my study still described voting as something important and something that they could use to help kind of break down that cycle and to help them to effectively reintegrate back into society. So my, my implications. Um, my findings on civic orientation have implications for the ways in which society perceives people with felony convictions. So though they are stigmatized as deviant, Perhaps beneath their demographic exterior and criminal record lies a civic participant willing to help register voters, fight to get their own rights restored, or someone who is simply willing to encourage others to get out and vote or to become more politically involved. So sure, these individuals, they don't have high levels of education. A lot of them are poor. Two of the, two of the individuals I interviewed were even homeless. But this does not necessarily mean that they don't know what's going on in their community, that they don't know what's going on at the state and national levels of government, and it does not necessarily mean that they don't want to get involved in politics. Secondly, my findings on civic orientation raise an important question, obviously, for the black participants in my sample. So will their civic orientation last after Obama? What will it look like once Obama is no longer in office? Will they continue to encourage people to vote? Will they continue to help drive people to the polls on Election Day? That's something that is going to have to be researched further. And then my findings on membership have implications for crime and recidivism in the United States. So according to Adam Rinkler, and this is his quote, voting is a meaningful participatory act through which individuals create and affirm their membership in the community and thereby transform their identities both as individuals and as part of a greater collectivity. So if voting is a process that links individuals to their state polity and norms and values, felon disenfranchisement severs this link and essentially places the disenfranchised against the norms and values of their state. So rather than establishing an identity with their community, former felons who are disenfranchised may be led away from the fabric of law-abiding society and hence led back into a life of crime. <laughs>